Hello todos. Welcome to our latest questions video. This is for our CM module, CM module one. Um, some quick background, some staging. I the class used to be called one to one marketing. You know, I've been teaching this class for over ten years. I've taught it more than ten times, and without question, at some point, it was called one to one marketing. And this Joseph Pine, Peppers and Rogers first article and the second article, we really started to see a shift in what was happening. You know, if you think about the late 80s, we saw total quality management and we saw satisfaction. We got into the 90s where we started talking about loyalty and loyalty and loyalty and we want referrals and holding on to our existing customers. So here we are in 1995. And this was one of the first landmark articles that's truly tried to nail this topic down. I think one of the most interesting aspects of this article is not once. Anywhere in this article is the phrase customer relationship management stated. If you look at the second article in 1999, it's we can't even go past the first sentence before it's spelled out. It's not even in this entire article. Some other interesting things about this article. We have some of our terms uh, here on page 103. Mass customizer, one-to-one -one marketing. On page 103 on the, on the right-hand column. When I say right-hand, I'm like looking at the page, right-hand column. We have learning relationships. I think we've heard that already. I love looking at these old articles and seeing these crazy examples from back in the day. CD-ROMs, it's kind of funny. Uh, page 106, we have more about learning relationships. Um, on page 108, in the left-hand column, right underneath this big header, they didn't use the term CLV because it didn't exist, but we were talking about over his or her lifetime, they were talking about the concept without it being spelled out. 110, we're talking about CD-ROM catalogs, fax response systems, and interactive television. Ooh. Page 111, we have Prodigy, American Online, and CompuServe. Raise your hand if you had any of those. Page 112, we have a reference to a Joseph Pine article, and we're going to be seeing some of those Joseph Pine articles. Page 113, we have a reference to that Satisfaction Services article, Zero Defects Comes to Services, that we talked about in last week's module. Also on 113, on the bottom right-hand corner, we're talking about Customer Share. So we're getting a feeling for all this. So let me see if I can answer your questions here. Uh, first question needs to be more specific. Tailored segments, too many choices, response? I have no idea what you're talking about here. I want to be helpful, but if you want me to answer a question, you're going to have to give me some more detail. This is not enough. My guess is, you know, everything about the first two articles is about segmenting. And the finer you can segment, the better. And no, there isn't too many choices. I understand the concept of customization, and I do agree that it is more intelligent and would be more in line with each customer's wants, but this can get pricey. Mass production is more cost efficient. Um, yes, mass production tends to be more cost efficient, but mass customization tends to bring more value to each individual. How can a company with a tight budget still cater to customer customization? Well, most of the time when we were talking about this in the one-to-one -one world, 1995, 1999, even through the early 2000s, we tended to talk about this in terms of products and service delivery. But now we're talking about it in a digital world. We're in Web 2.0 world. We're in bottom-up land. And now it doesn't take a tight budget. And what Target can deliver to us in terms of promo 
what Amazon can term is to us in terms of recommendations, what Netflix can terms enough, that's not expensive, relatively speaking. Um, we're, there's a number of questions on this, and we're going to get more into this. So hold, hold, hold this question here. Companies such as home builders, real estate brokers, and appliance manufacturers are companies that do not frequently interact with end users and does not have a learning relationship with customers. Given this, and putting aside today's technology where manufacturers can interact with the end users, why would these companies want a learning relationship? Well, home builders, for instance, may want to maintain a relationship either for a future sale or for future services. So you spent the money to get that $450,000 house, but do you have um, an alarm system? Do you have a fully integrated app ecosystem so all your appliances work together? Can the real estate broker then recommend lawn service companies or sprinkler repair companies to help you out? And the real estate broker would make a recommendation and get a little kickback in return? There's all kinds of advantages to having a learning relationship. You know, recommendations or future positive word of mouth is one of them. But if there's a way that a home builder could potentially sell more services or a real estate broker could eventually broker more other types of services, there's other ways that you can take a learning relationship and turn it into some kind of a revenue stream. Customer preferences. Identify and provide information about themselves, the customers. However, few companies will only want this only few companies will only want this type of relationship. Why? Was it more expensive when this article was written? Absolutely positively yes. It was substantially more expensive when this article was written. And also it wasn't as from the consumer side as culturally acceptable as it is today. Is it easier with the expansion of the internet and social media, no if, ands, or buts. It is substantially easier now to collect very, very good information by individuals on their preferences. I mean, just your clickstream alone provides tons of data to firms. Um, we're going to get into the ethics and the creepiness of that and some questions that are upcoming. What is the difference between personalization and customization? Uh, for the purposes of this class and the first two articles, I really don't see them any different. You know, I would consider these one and the same and very much interchangeable. Um, same thing here, interchangeable. Some customers prefer using personalized products. So is there some conflict between these two things? Um, I don't think there's a conflict between these two things. I define them as one and the same. You know. Now we're gonna see in the Welcome to the Experience Economy where Joseph Pine tries to split these in a certain way. You know, slight customization versus, you know, complete individual mass customization. But for all intents and purposes, broadly speaking, these two things are the same. If every customer has his or her own preference, how can we classify all the information on all customers? Well, I, I hate to say this, but this is very easy to do these days and it's not very expensive. And every search, every search in the history of Google that has ever happened with that search bar is saved. Everyone, everywhere in the entire world. Google has a record of it. It's not that hard to do. Are all products and service truly custom customizable? Well, no and yes. I mean, you may get a product such as an iPhone, which the iPhone in and of itself, you cannot change a thing on that. However, when it comes to how you use it and what apps you use, then it is really customizable. How you want your alarms, your alerts, your notifications coming to you. What, who's in your VIP, um, who is allowed to wake you up in the middle of the night, that's customizable. 
you know we are moving without question into a world of individualistic customization even from standard platforms services are the same I mean look what the casinos do from a modification and a service standpoint look what hotels do how can companies compensate for their products and services that are not customizable well the most common strategy is that products and services that are not customizable are cheaper they're more affordable you know the author talks about retailers having a big advantage over manufacturers as customers want to touch, feel, browse, and experience. However, don't you think retailers such as Best Buy, Staples, Office Depot are losing business because of web e-commerce stores like Amazon, eBay, etc.? Well, yes, there is no question that Best Buy, Staples, and Office Depot are losing business to the web. And it's because businesses like Amazon are doing a very good job with information collection and customizing offers to consumers. Best Buy does not do a good job with that. Office Depot does not do a good job with that. Staples Dues does an okay job with that. But retailers like REI don't have a problem. Retailers like CVS or Walgreens don't have a problem. They are retailers. And to be honest with you, retailers always have a significant advantage over the manufacturers because the retailers get the matching of the credit card data and the loyalty card data and the consumer. They have the better knowledge base where manufacturers just manufacture and ship. You know, and unless they do the research on their own or have some kind of relationship with the retailers that they sell to, the manufacturers are cut out of the entire knowledge economy aspect of this one-to-one -one marketing stuff. What is the best criteria to hire a, man, a customer manager based upon? Ooh, well, it depends on what you want accomplished. But if you think about the, uh, the CMT article that we read in one of the first modules this semester, you know, you need to be a marketing person and a technology person. You know, and we're going to see some, art, some questions as we go further down, you know, where is this information housed? Is this a marketing function? Is it an IT function? Is it, well, you got to stop thinking along those old silos. Break the silos down, be more market oriented, and create a job specific for that particular task. Forget about the silos. Who cares about departments? How do consumers teach these companies about their preferences or needs? Well, I don't know if consumers teaching is the correct way to do it but just through the process of going through the buying experience if you're in a retail store you know they know what day you bought what coupons you bought your loyalty card history your credit card history and they can use that information you know they can compile this it's a lot easier to do in this web 2.0 world when they have a social media stream or they have your browser data, they have your cookie data, and then they learn all your preferences or needs. They know what websites you like to go to. They know what you want to do. Yes, it's creepy. Has the constant improvement in technology capabilities and data mining made it easier for companies to create learning relationships with consumers? No if, ands, or buts, yes. It's all about learning relationships. We're going to talk about data mining, we're going to talk about big data, we're going to talk about this in terms of CRM, but you need to have a learning relationship, you need to be able to have a mechanism to collect data, you need to have a mechanism to store data, you need to have a mechanism to analyze data, and you need to have a mechanism to report data. Those are going to come up into the, uh, the big data articles we have later in the semester. It's difficult for companies to try and establish an effective learning relationship with consumers. Is it difficult? Uh, no, not at all. Sometimes people balk at the idea of providing information and personal preferences to companies and businesses. Um, they may balk 
but they didn't delete their Facebook account. They didn't stop using credit cards. They didn't stop using their loyalty card. They didn't stop going to the gym and using their gym card. Let's see, what do I even have in my wallet here? Do I have any loyalty card stuff? Um, I mean, hypothetically speaking, I'm going to get to this Kim Kardashian question in a second. Um, Safari, preferences, privacy. Just in the last time that I looked, 14 more cookies, and this is not even 30 minutes ago, were added to my web browser. So these are 904 websites that are storing cookies within my web browser. Let's see how long before the number goes up again. Let me see. Let me just change something real quick. Go like this, 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 this. And let's see what happens to see if the number changed. 892. It dropped a little bit. Let's see if it changed. You know. Oh, 898. Eight, oh, 924. You know. Raise your hand if you haven't deleted your cookies in the last week. Raise your hand if you haven't deleted your cookies in the last month. Well, then... You know, you can't complain about privacy if you're not doing anything about it. Which department of a company oversees the business of maintaining learning relationships? Um, this is that comment that I just said earlier about breaking the functioning silos. We have to get away from which department. I don't care about departments anymore. I care about being market-oriented. And the firm should figure out a way who should do it. Whether it's marketing, whether it's IT, I don't care. But the function needs to get done. I don't want to argue about who should be doing it. Just do it. You know. Okay? All right, so here we are. We move on to our next article. This is a toolkit article. This is the first of many toolkit articles this module and this semester. Toolkit articles are how-to articles. Um a lot of great questions from you guys with this article. This is a much more, the first one was a conceptual article trying to say, look, this phenomenon is happening. The 1999 article is the phenomenon is already happening. This is how you should do it. This is a how-to article. Now, there's some great stuff in here. So if you notice, even the way the article's laid out, Okay, it's really a how-to article. Do this, then this, then this, then this. We have some foreshadowing in here. We have the previous article foreshadowed on page 151, the first page. On page 154, we have Susan Fournier's article we're going to read next week, foreshadowed. We have lots of good bullet points on things you should do, such as cross-selling, reduce customer attrition, higher levels of satisfaction and loyalty, reduce transaction times. These are all the reasons why we want CRM. Now, on page 156, 157, it's the page with this big Stanford thing. Right here is where the skew question is going to come up. And I thank whoever asked this question thumbs up to you because I was going to bring it up. And then we have the gap tool in the back. So you have a tool. Okay? Let's answer some questions. You can get information about your customers from non-competitive companies in your field or from national change of address database. Are these ethical? Well, the correct answer is these are legal. You know, there is nothing to prevent you from getting the information this way. Is it ethical? I think in this case, because of the culture we live in in the U.S., yes, it's ethical. It's creepy, but it's ethical. You know, you're not doing things that hasn't been done before and consumers don't necessarily know about it, you know. Improvements of cost efficiency directs the company interaction towards more automation, which results in less costs to a certain extent. Isn't this less efficient and generally not acceptable to the customer, which can result 
in customers leaving. You know, I don't, you know, this was 1999. We're getting into a situation right now that there's so many things now that we're doing through apps that we're not even talking to anybody anymore. It's all technology based. I mean, how do we used to get a cab in the past? We made a phone call. How do we get a cab today? Uber, come pick me up. You talk to anybody? Nope. You don't even talk to them when you're in the car. You don't even have to exchange cash with them. You just pay, 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 18% tip. There you go. Done. That's it. I think it's more culturally acceptable now. Uh, we don't necessarily need to have the customer interaction unless we want it. Many people are accepting not to have the customer interaction. Why go to the supermarket? Just have someone deliver the stuff to my house. Thank you. Let me hit pause for one second. There we go. Sorry about that. The inability to identify individual customers result in not being able to differentiate them and not being able to adapt behavior to address their needs. What would be an example of being not being able to identify individual customers? Uh, vending machines. You know, you pay with cash. There's not that much learning happening right there. But it could be the case that vending machines, uh, if they had credit card, if there was loyalty type information, um, they are in Japan putting, you know, scanner stuff where they can actually do facial recognition and recognize what you are and your preferences. They can see that, you know, you ordered all healthy stuff in the past. And maybe the vending machine can be rearranged just for you. That would be neat. But right now, vending machines is a good example. There's a lot of things along that line. Sports. Ah, here's the question of questions. Thank you so much. Steep skew. Skew is a fundamental concept when we're talking about CRM. This is the 80-20 rule for all intents and purposes. And when it comes to CRM, we think about it more as 90-10 or 95-5 or 98-2, where 98% of your, re your revenue comes from 2% of your customers. The steeper the skew, you know, 98-2, 90-10 is steeper than 80-20 or 70-30 or 60-40. 50-50 is flat. There's no skew at all. The steeper the skew, the more you are in a situation for CRM, the easier it will be. Now, when this article was written, you know, the software and the databases were very expensive to run. So only super high-end B2B scenarios could you really worry about skew or you were so concerned about skew. Each year that I teach this class, the steeper the skew question tends to disappear. You know, where it is so cost effective, you know, through loyalty card and through apps and to get customer preferences and to acquire the data. You know, it used to be the case that companies used to have their own proprietary software and their own proprietary databases and all like that. You can outsource it now. You can go to Amazon Web Services and pay you know, $500 a month and get it all done for you. I mean, it's it's really ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. The skew is on page 157, though. You really have to take a look at that. It's about a one paragraph. Now, to answer the question, um, value to the enterprise greatly vary on top customers and account for the vast majority of businesses. Would this be an example for BMW? No. No, BMW is not a very good example when it comes to SKU because, you know, even if you buy five BMWs in your entire lifetime, you can't even be one one percent, one one hundredth of a percent of BMW's revenues for a given year. You know, steep SKU would be some individual entity being, you know, a very large percentage of BMW's revenues for the whole year. That's what SKU is. Can one-to-one -one marketing be, at a greater scale, a company branding one company that focuses on various others of another brand? Well, there's no question that you can use this CRM data collection learning relationship to cross-sell, either with other services or brands of your own company or developing a partnership with another company. Like American Express can learn who's the concert goers and they can do some cross-selling with, uh, 
Live Nation to push more tickets. We talk about in many of the articles focusing on the top percentage of customers. Yes. But can retention engagement of the bottom percentage card be worth looking at into? It is getting, it is becoming sig significantly more cost effective to do so. And it is worth looking into. And we have that in the next article, as a matter of fact. If so, in what cases and why that it does. I'm going to hold this off because the next How Valuable Word of Mouth article gets into this. So hold that thought for a second. Using customers' historical data will violate their privacy of customers. Um, no, it doesn't. You know, I just went into my cookies, and I'm telling you right now, hey, let's go take a peek again, just for giggles and giggles. Um, da -da, Safari, preferences, privacy. Has it changed? 287, 284, 291. No, still pretty much the same. I mean, if you look at them, here's all the cookies. These are all companies, 9 to 5 Mac. This is a blog that I follow. AACSB. This is the organization that governs business schools. ABC News, Accenture. What is Accenture putting a cookie on my computer for? Um, Axiom is scary. Axiom is the largest... Um, privacy data collection company in the United States and perhaps the world. They are very, very, very scary. You know, you want to go like that and you want to go remove. <laughs> because you actually want to remove all of them, but, you know, Axiom scary stuff. YouTube. What's YouTube putting cookies on here for me? Uh, yeah, YMCA Burlington County is putting cookies on here for me. Yelp, you know, it's ridiculous. I'll remove this one and done, you know. It's just too easy to collect the cookies. Uh, here we go. And it's not violating your privacy. You know about it. You should do something about it. Most of you didn't even realize the cookies were there. And if you did, oh, yeah, there's cookies. I delete them every so often. If you go back, you haven't deleted them in six months. How does a company as large as GE or Bank of America determine how capable they are at interacting and customizing with their customers? Well, let's talk about Bank of America. Maybe this is a question from Allie. So Bank of America probably does this from a profitability standpoint. You know, there are customers at the bottom end of the totem pole, so to speak, that are not very profitable, that they charge these customers to go into a bank and talk to a teller, they charge these customers to use checks. They, you know, if you don't have a certain type of bank account, you don't get free checking, or you don't get interest checking, or it costs you eight dollars to go talk to a teller. You know, when I was in my PhD program and I was broke, it, the only way I got free banking is if I used the ATM machine. If I didn't use the ATM machine, it wasn't free. I would get charged, and that really sucked. You know. But that's how they determined, you know, they segmented their customer base. And they decided who they wanted to develop relationships with and who they wanted to maintain a so-so-so relationship with because it wasn't profitable. And to be honest with you, I think they were crazy because, you know, now I got a whole bunch of money and I hate that bank for what they did to me before. So, a little short-sighted. Isn't data mining a big part of one-to-one -one marketing? Yes, yes, and yes. We answered this in our earlier question. Would it help a company to find patterns of customers which would help them predict market better needs? Yes. This is exactly what Amazon does. This is exactly what Netflix does. This is what eBay does. They make recommendations. It's called a recommendation engine instead of a search engine. They make recommendations based on your past purchase history, based on your cookie data, based on what you've clicked and what you've looked at. I mean, you could be looking at something in Amazon, you can go to three other different websites, and the cookies follow you, and you'll see the ads on some ESPN website on the side of things you were just looking at on Amazon. Kind of crazy, isn't it? Yes, it's creepy. I'll, I'll, yes, it's creepy. The article mentions the added benefits of cross-selling. Cross-selling is one of the, no question, benefit of developing a CRM relationship with your customers. 
When customers purchase products and services across the company, who takes responsibility for owning the customer relationship across different business units? You know, this is back to my market-oriented, get rid of the damn silos, get rid of the titles, get rid of the departments. I don't care who takes ownership of it. But usually what happens is, because it's hard to get rid of departments, is you have marketing as a department, you have sales as a department, you have IT as a department, but the the sharing of information across those three in very good market-oriented firms happens within the software. So something happens in marketing, an alert goes over to finance or goes over to IT that says this customer just purchased product A, they probably will need product B in the very near future. And the software, the CRM software, helps make sure that that relationship with that customer gets shared across departments. Social CRM. Is it easier for smaller companies and entities with fewer customers to have successes with building learning relationships and strong one-to-one -one marketing? I don't think it's any cheaper or more expensive these days. Now, usually smaller companies do it more on a personal level. You know, they have fewer customers. They tend to have deeper relationships with fewer amounts of customers. Um, smaller businesses tend to only have one or two or three or four big customers anyway. It's, you know, it's easier to do that. Um, but really, even, you know, we can go out and buy a, uh, a Salesforce package and we pay $30 a month for 10 employees and it can store, I don't know, a couple terabytes of data and it's like $30 a month. It's really very cheap. Salesforce is one of the better companies out there. Um, is one-to-one -one marketing as effective if a consumer base is too diverse? What happens if people access information in too many different forms or if consumers are too varied based on factors such as input age and levels? Now, these are all, we're talking about computers here. We can segment on anything. It, you know, I, you know, and really this whole one-to-one -one marketing thing is segments of one. I don't want a segment of 3,500 people. I want a segment of Dr. Dano. I want a segment of Megan. I'll pick on Megan. I want a segment of Anthony. I don't want a segment of 3,500 people. I want a segment of one person. And we can do that these days with the technology that we have. Okay? Good. Let's do some more good stuff. Professor Kumar. This guy rocks. He's at Georgia State. Um, and this is a toolkit article. You notice the date. You notice that this article immediately refers on the first page, right at the bottom, the one number you need to know to grow, the article we read for last week. That was a landmark article. These guys, meaning these professors, took that article one step further. So questions. How can we calculate a customer's contribution to margin? What is net present value? Well, net present value is the same net present value that you learned in finance. It's how much they are worth in the future. So we can calculate someone's cost contribution to margin, overall contribution to margin, by de determining their revenue stream now and what it could be in the future. What are customer total values? Does this mean CLV plus CRV? Well, that's what they're talking about in terms of this article because they were the only two things that they measured. We're on page 142, and we have the estimating the customer lifetime value plus their customer referral value. So this is from the revenue stream perspective, and this is from the recommendation stream perspective. So this is the one number you need to grow that all they did was really measure this in the one number you need to grow. They didn't measure this as well as these professors did. Databases could benefit a company, but what about the cost? They're not expensive anymore. You don't even have to own the databases, and you don't even need the employees to look at the data. A lot of it's automated. When you get a chance, Google Amazon Web Services, AWS. Pretty much, it's you'll be stunned. I mean, the U.S. government even uses Amazon for their databases. It's crazy. I recently came across... 
a strategy where you can order a phone. It's called the One Plus One phone. Only if someone recommends or refers you or sends you an invite. They created a lot of hype and excitement by creating product scarcity, um, which created buzz in the marketplace. Would this be considered a value-added word of mouth? Sure, I don't see why it wouldn't. I mean, this is a very good strategy. Whether they can back up the hype is another thing. But it's one way to generate interest, you know, some exclusivity, some scarcity. There is no question of the six principles of persuasion that I did in my webinar. One of the six is scarcity. It's scientifically proven to work. What companies currently utilize or have implemented successful referral programs in the past? Well, to be honest with you, most companies don't talk about this stuff. But a lot of cell phone companies do. Gyms kind of do recommendation programs. Uh, you know, Just think about if there's a monetary benefit for you to refer someone, that's someone doing some kind of referral program. You know? But to be honest with you, there's very few articles on this. This is a gem. This is one of those ones you keep and you use in your company. The formulas are here. It's very easy to explain to other people. What would you say that word of mouth is just as valuable for companies of varying sizes? Would you say that it's very... Yeah, sure. Especially because it's not as expensive to do as it used to be. Would a mom and pop shop stand to gain more from word of mouth than a global corporation? Well, a mom and pop shop doesn't exist without word of mouth. It's a necessary. A global corporation... You know, may have other revenue streams that they don't have to goose their sales as much with word of mouth. Okay. Uh, before we move from this article, uh, I want you to go to page 143 and the doing saying gap. I remember reading this article for the first time, and one of the most interesting aspects of this article was the two columns that we see here that they were saying. Some of our most, in a CRM mentality, a steep skew, lifetime value customers are not our best in terms of referral. It's actually some of those mid-tier ones do better referrals, and I really can't explain why this is the case, but it's well documented here. So think about it this way. We were talking about last week, if you weren't a 9 or a 10 on a 10-point scale, then you were bad. And here we have the 5s, the 6s, and the 7s that are actually relatively profitable. You know, if we look at page 144 and we see the matrix here, right, we see that affluence may have a strong revenue number, but they have no referral number. But if we look at the champions, which has a small customer lifetime value, but a very high referral number, these customers are actually, they're not as much as the affluence, but it's a very healthy number. You know, I'm eyeballing it. You know, it's almost a thousand dollars, you know, a little bit less. Misers are terrible. You know, that's one you would get rid of. And the advocates, look, a really low CRV number, but very high CR, CLV, a very high CRV. Uh, that's a very interesting little finding there, which goes contrary to a lot of what we talked about last week. All right, we have two easier articles right in a row. These are Business Horizons. Social Hub, so here's the Kim K question. Is Kim K a social hub? Well... I really hate to say that Kim K is a social hub because in my mind, she's not. She's more of a celebrity endorser. Uh, but the way the article defines it, yes, she's a, she's a social hub. She's only following 126 people. She's got almost 30 million followers. She gets paid somewhere between ten dollars and $50,000 a tweet if she's doing something oh luck okay very good kim k you know so what's kim k usually do i tweet whether i'm wearing clothes or i'm not wearing clothes well, i'm wearing clothes or i'm not wearing clothes my problem with kim k is she's really much more top down than she is bottom up 
Meaning, her I'm in her tweets and replies comment. I mean, if we just look at her tweet stream, she's tweeting all the time, right? But she's not having conversations with anybody. She's, look at me, look at me, look who I'm with, look what clothes I'm wearing, look what I'm doing, these are my commercials, this is my, you know, not very interesting, you know. The more interesting social media people have a very rich tweet and reply stream, you know. Okay, that's enough of Kim K. A characteristic of viral marketing is usually associated with social media applications, such as Twitter, Facebook, Second Life, blah, 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 blah. blah. Would this also include other applications such as Yelp and TripAdvisor? I want you to think of viral as anything that is digital that has the ability to spread and expand quickly. And sure, Yelp has the ability for something to spread and expand trip quickly. So does a trip advisor. I mean, it's really easy to do on Twitter and Facebook, you know. But what we can do on TripAdvisor and Yelp is something that even 10 years ago was very, uh, not 10 years ago, 2004. Even in 2004, the effect from a viral perspective wasn't all that strong, you know. The Burger King defriending phenomenon. With all the defriending, did Facebook respond or did it not care because it gave Facebook publicity? Actually, I think they did care. Um, I think Facebook didn't. I mean, it's the last thing in Facebook's, you know, they don't want anybody to defriend anyone. They want the more relationships than possible. They actually would rather have everyone with a thousand relationships in their database so they can acquire more data, you know. Very sneaky thing that Burger King did, you know. Um, what are some companies do? What are some companies that do significant viral marketing? Um, there are so many that I can't even count, but I think one of the easiest ones to talk about is Oreo, and Oreo has the ability, in a whimsical, fun kind of way, to take the Oreo cookie and put it into daily conversation. So whatever's happening in Oreo land, they they have a way of, oh, search. Let's see, Oreo cookie, you know. They're just, it's fun. It's either games, here's a Valentine's Day, Red Velvet, Love, Seven Layer Dip for the Super Bowl. You know, whatever's happening in popular culture, they figure out a way to turn Oreo into part of that cultural conversation. You're going to get the Doug, Doug Holtz article in two weeks. This is exactly what Doug Holt is advocating. Triple Decker Sliders. I mean, this is all Super Bowl stuff. Let me see if I can rewind back and get any New Year's. January 5th. Happy Holidays, New Year's, Stockings, Christmas. Um, you know, you'll see something for President's Day. You'll see something for uh, Pride Day where they'll take Oreo cookies and they'll have a whole stack of lay Oreo cookies in rainbow colors. Um, I think Oreo does a fantastic job. If this is something you are really, 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 really interested in, really interested in. Ah, no, no. This is one of the books you should read as part of your book this semester. This is Contagious by Jonah Berger. He is a professor at Wharton. This book is very good. It's very good. Um, is viral marketing is viral marketing a form of electronic word of mouth? Yes, that's exactly what viral marketing is. It's electronic word of mouth. Sometimes they would say word of M O U S E just to be goofy, meaning this thing. 
Um, what is the meaning of ordinary good luck? Meaning something went viral and you did nothing to make it viral. It just happened. You know, without good luck, dose it means that even companies that use infectious message and seed it connected subcodes. That's it. Um, you know, when we're t we've talked about top down versus bottom up, okay. In a bottom up world, the crowd controls the conversation, and there are situations that you cannot avoid undesirable outcomes. You know, you just you just can't do it. But you have to understand that that's part of the admission, uh, the the cost of admission of getting in. If you want the good viral, you may also have to have some bad viral as part of it. Some companies are too afraid of that because they're too top down and they're too controlling. Other firms don't have a problem with that at all. I mean, there's always negative word of mouth. It's just that companies are not used to hearing it or seeing it. You know, monkeys, you know. I'd rather see it. Word of mouth recommendations and reviews. How can you tell if they're from a trusted source or valid? Uh, it's very difficult. And as a matter of fact, and there's a couple other questions that are coming up here. Uh, Yelp and Amazon, more than 50% of everything that you see is fake. Some producers, like a former colleague of mine, asked me to download his app and give it a five-star rating. It was not an app I ever saw myself using, and it pissed me off so much that he asked me to do this. I never gave it a chance. I guess I wanted to know if you can decipher false advertising from true reviews. Um, you can't. This is very challenging, and this is a gray area, and if you want to talk about something that is unethical, I think this is one of those gray areas that crosses the line into being unethical that is very difficult to see what is a true review versus what is a planted review. And I wish that we could get at this. And you know something? Right now, no one's really caring too much, which so the status quo gets perpetuated. Um, but, you know, if you Google false reviews on Amazon, you'll get a gazillion hits and articles about what reviews are fake and the percentage or average number of fake reviews. False reviews on Yelp, yeah, you can Google that and get tons of hits. Um, do you see cable television and traditional TV advertising dying out in the new future? I have been predicting this for 10 plus years and it still hasn't happened yet. Conceptually speaking, in my lifetime, it's going to happen. I'm stunned it hasn't happened yet. Because the cost structure of a network TV show is getting too expensive. You know, we can watch it on demand. We can watch it on Netflix. We can watch it 18 million different ways. Other than sports, if let's put it this way. If there was no sports supporting network TV right now, it would have been dead. It would have been dead, 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 dead. NBC is carried by Sunday Night Football. It's the most watched TV show on all of television. More profits and advertising dollars come out of Sunday Night Football. It supports the entire network. You know, Without sports, then yes, this would have happened already. Is it going to happen? Yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's absolutely going to happen. Please write that down. It's going to happen. Why should firms, you know, I sent you an article, a link not that long ago, that more and more firms are taking money away from network TV and putting it in the digital. It keeps happening. Year after year, it keeps happening. Why should firms avoid sending viral marketing campaigns to a broad audience? <coughs> well, they should avoid sending them if they're not there to participate in it. You know, standing on a street corner with a megaphone yelling, look at me, look at me, look at me, is not going to really do you much. Sending one-way tweets out on Twitter or putting blog posts on that no one cares about, you know, you're trying to start something virally that you're not also supporting in any other way. You know, you should probably work with your audience as opposed to you just doing it all yourself. Crowd. Think crowd. I, if anything else throughout this entire semester, I want you to think about the bottom-up mentality. 
The article mentions seeding messages to small subcultures. It's a fantastic way. Or influencers. Or market mavens. Is this the article that talks about market mavens? Yes, it does. I'm on page 256. Um, 256. We're on the top of the right-hand column, and it says uh, Frick and Price, 1987. This is a Journal of Marketing article. Price is Linda Price. She's actually one of my professors. And the reason why the market maven concept is so popular in culture is because Malcolm Gladwell read that article, called her at her office, did an interview, and he made that a central concept within the Tipping Point book. So as much as I love Malcolm Gladwell, he gets all his great ideas from academics. He's a journalist. He's a very good storyteller. God, I wish I could write like him. Is there a particular type of emotion that generates an emotional response more frequently than others? Well, that's one of the chapters in this book. And if you don't have emotion, you won't have viral. The more emotion you get, the more viral. You need that emotional uh, response. I don't have a particular, you know, sometimes it's a negative emotion, sometimes it's a positive emotion, but most of the time it's a positive emotion. I was wondering if an example of Huber tends to resonate more than, say, truth. Um, in this book, it's not necessarily humor, it's something will go viral if it makes the person who sends it look smart. That is one of the things. If by sending this message to a lot of other people, I look smart, guess what? That gets forwarded on more than anything else does. Humor helps. Okay. Um, we're getting there. Another, another relatively easy article. Uh, key characteristic of Twitter is to tell the world that what you're doing in a picture moment in time. It has to be closely connected with loved ones no matter where they are physically be. Is there a key difference between doing this on Twitter versus Facebook? Absolutely. Twitter is more about immediacy and being in the moment. And Facebook is more about recording your life. It's more about what you did. Twitter is more about what you are doing now. Um, you know, Facebook. Here's the pictures of us when we were on vacation. Or here's the pictures of us earlier in the day when we were at the Magic Kingdom. You know, this is at night. You're in your hotel room and you're playing with Facebook and you're uploading stuff. Um, Twitter. You know, anything that happened 15 minutes ago on Twitter happened a million years ago on Twitter. Twitter is all about the now. Immediacy. From a contribution perspective, is Twitter more conducive to organization, companies, mass media, sports teams than it is the individual? Um, in my opinion, there's no difference between whether Twitter is more conductive for organizations versus the individual. It really depends. It depends on what the goals are of the individual versus the organization. You know, the important thing with Twitter is, is Twitter, the best Twitter is a dialogue. And it's a dialogue about what's happening now. There are some organizations that do phenomenal customer service work through Twitter. There are some individuals that do tremendous branding efforts through Twitter. You know, what is the best mechanism to obtain followers on Twitter? Buying them? No. Um, most people, I don't think it's the best mechanism, but the most common one is a follow for a follow. I follow you, you follow me. And there are people out there, I get 15, 20, 30 people a day starting to follow me on Twitter, and by the end of the week, if I don't follow them back, they all drop. You know, I don't follow people just for the sake of following. My Twitter feed, I'm following 300 something people. I just deleted a bunch of people earlier last night. You know, if I'm not having a conversation with someone or it's someone I don't know or it's not a thought leader that I care about following and seeing, then guess what? I, I get them out of there because the stream just gets too messy. With such an emphasis only on 140 characters, is it best for companies to seek engagement of consumers on a site such as Twitter instead of pushing information on products to them? Um, I want you to think about it this way and remind me when we meet in person to do my lecture on all roads lead to Rome. 
Twitter is like a movie trailer. It's not the movie. Twitter is a wonderful traffic cop. You get a tweet out. You hope to give them a link. And that link brings you somewhere else where you can truly engage. Twitter is an appetizer. Twitter is a movie trailer. It's not the meal. It's not the movie. Use Twitter to send them somewhere else. Twitter shouldn't be the only platform. It should be one of many platforms. Twitter and a blog, genius. How can we trust our customer via, via how can we trust our customer via viral marketing? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what you're trying to ask here. How can we trust viral marketing information? That's a different question. That's not as easy to do. I mean, if you want to talk about one of the nut nuttiness or the downsides to a bottom-up world, it makes it a lot harder from the user perspective to have to do the search and the trusting and the figuring out. I mean, if we used to read stuff from CNN or the New York Times, well, we could trust that as a journalistic source. You know, someone talking on a blog or talking on Twitter, we need some other kind of information to decide whether we can trust this individual or not. Microblogging is great and has helped companies and individuals to be well connected. However, don't you feel there needs to be some policy done on data that companies sell and use that you might impact your privacy? I'm not sure if companies like Twitter or Facebook care about what third-party company who purchased the data does with the data. Well, Twitter and Facebook doesn't share any data with third-party companies. They use all the data for themselves and they have treasure troves of it. It's the credit card companies, that's, it's the U.S. government that sells your data. I mean, in the state of Florida, if you have a driver's license, they sell all the information on your driver's license. You know, it's just terrible. Um, but the thing is, in the United States, there's very weak privacy laws. There's nothing illegal about this. It's creepy, but it's not illegal, particularly in social. I have a blog post I'm going to write, and then uh, I'll, I'll forward it to you guys about some of the stuff. Do you agree with the author that microblog can lead to a stronger social relationships and improve overall well-being? I don't know about improving overall well-being, but it helps. It's a component of building a relationship. Can social media microblogs really replace interperson interaction? Um, interperson interaction is richer and stronger. But, you know, there's some ways that there's some relationships that I have because of social media or blogs that I can only have because of social media or blogs. There's a reporter that I, you know, with all the Apple junk that I did, he was, you know, for the L.A. Times, you know, he was on the West Coast. I never met him in person. I talked to him on the phone once. And the L.A. Times moved him to Toulouse, France. Well, guess what? I still have a relationship with him on Twitter, but I still haven't met him personally yet. You know, would it be great if him and I went out for a couple beers? Sure, it'd be great. But can I pull that off right now? No. So I'm happy for Twitter. Are universities and companies using microblogs as an educational tool? Um, yeah. Um, the Seton Hall at Hall business is uh, somewhat active of a stream. I'm on there an awful lot. Do you have any examples? Yeah, I just did. I mean, a lot of times, microblogs is the movie trailer. There's a new software update. They announce it in the t in, in a microblog, and then they want you to go somewhere to get the full detail, the whole movie. Dr. Dano. I'm Dr. Dano. I don't know who this lat guy is. In your opinion, do you think it's better for companies using outlets like Twitter to incorporate humor and levity when appropriate? It's not Twitter that should be appropriate for human or levity. It's your brand. If your brand is okay for humor and levity, then great. If you're the Pope, you're not using Twitter for levity. That's not who you are. You're the Pope. But you could still use Twitter. So it's really a function of what you want to do and where. Like for Oreo, it is humor and levity. You know, but for the Pope, it's not. For Obama, it's not. 
do you th- for a lot of airline companies, there's no airline jokes coming from an airline company on Twitter. No, it's more of a customer service thing. It depends on what your strategy is. Do you think it's more effective to employ a stricter, more consistent approach to messages posted on Twitter? It depends on what your strategy is. One of the shortest articles in the entire semester, what makes a great tweet. Here's a bunch of professors that, man, can you believe this? 44,000 tweets got categorized by thousands of students. Isn't that crazy? So if you take this article and you kind of, this is how it was in the magazine, like this, where the lines line up and you kind of do that. So these are the best and these are the worst and they kind of have some percentages. It's kind of cute, somewhat interesting. Didn't see any types of tweets that had a large percentage of best or worst. It's because it's not the exact wording of a tweet. It's a type of a category. Random thought. A self-promotion kind of thing. The examples are actually on the phone that line up with a random thought example. With a self-promotion example. With an opinion complaint example. That being said, what do you think is the best type of tweet to generate and follow engagement? I don't think you should think about it as the best type of tweet. How do you want engagement? Engagement is a conversation. Have a conversation with someone. Do what you do in text on Twitter. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's an ongoing dialogue. If you're not having an ongoing dialogue, you don't have engagement. Write that down. It's that simple. Can we define what kind of tweet is useful or not? What is the criterion? Well, it depends on your goal and what you think it is. For some people, you know... 20% 20% worth reading and maintain presence is useful, even though that's the worst percentage on the on page 37. You have to decide what is a success metric, and based on that success metric, you will determine whether the tweet was useful or not. You know. um, the last one, our most recent one, 2014, choosing the right customer. You know... We kind of did not have the word CRM in this article at all, to be honest with you. I had this in here because most of the firms they talk about in here were HBO, LinkedIn, all technology web 2.0 companies. So let me see how I can be helpful here. First time we've ever had this article in class. Can you elaborate on local value creation, 53? 53, local value creators. So I think we're getting into this perspectives, capabilities, and profit potential. And where is the local? Low price. If customer value, profit serves the customer has a local taste, perfect. Well, it's just people in Philly versus people in New York. You know, can you customize products or services that are more beneficial for people in Philly versus people who are more beneficial in New York? For instance, in New York, there's a hell of a lot more mass transit than there is in Philly. So could you do something that maybe your social media or whatever you're doing is more consumable, downloadable, that people can listen to on the train for those customers in New York? Perhaps. Using interactive control processes, managers should continually ask three questions. What has changed? Why? And what is more important? And what are we doing about it? All right, I'll agree with you. I don't know if that's a question or not, but sounds good to me. Questions. What has changed, why, and what are we doing about it? Again, I don't know why. I don't think this is a question. Um, How can we keep pace with the change of the world to improve our business model? Well, if you're market-oriented, if you are market-oriented, you have a fanatical external relationship with your customers a fanatical external view versus competition and you have incredible firm interfirm communication across the silos and that's how you keep pace with what's happening in the world and depending on what's happening on the world is how you modify your business if you are market oriented this is not a problem that's why we started the semester with that 
How can Bank of America use data analytics for treasury services? Their clients are not individuals. They are institutions looking for the best way to manage their cash. Well, you can certainly give tips, recommendations, and have an ongoing conversation because the clients that are using treasury services have needs. They want knowledge. Feed them the knowledge. The knowledge to act upon. The knowledge to not act upon. It's information. Information is king. Knowledge is king. The more knowledge a learning relationship you can have with your customers, the better off you will be. The more value you are providing. And you could do that through microblogging and you could do that through blogging. You could do that through closed networks as well. What is actual use of what is the actual use of data analytics? I think this is everything that we've talked about today. Developing a learning relationship about your customers through technology. Data analytics is the data collection, the analysis, the storage, the reporting, and the acting upon. Is it used for finding customer values or is it used for finding a new customers? Uh, yes and yes. Does the analytics team come under the marketing branch? I don't care about functioning silos. I don't care whether it's marketing. Many times this is coming out of finance, believe it or not. I want to I would like to merge the finance department, the marketing department and the ID department to be called them the whatever you want to call them department. Because most of the things that we care the most about being a marketing geek happens in marketing, finance and IT. <laughs> Get rid of the damn silos. Get rid of the branches. Are there any companies that change their primary customer to change the direction for the company? All the time. Pretty every entrepreneurial firm out there, yes. Twitter's changed a hundred times. Facebook pivots once a once a year, pretty much. Um, they have to, because if they realize that their primary customer is not someone they can grow with, then they have to find a customer they can grow with. And if it's not the primary customer, it might be, you know, product segments, and they change their product segments. I mean, Apple in 2010 was a $10 billion company because of iPhone. Well, without iPhone, and they were a $74 billion quarter company, not a year, $50 billion five years ago. Now they're $74 billion a quarter. And it's because of iPhone. iPhone is more than two-thirds of all that. Um, that was a monster change to the direction of the company. Mac still exists, and they were a Macintosh company and a computer company from the get-go. They're going to be a watch company before the end of our semester. For a company in the process of selecting its primary customer, does the right choice have to be the best fit for perspective? Da, 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 da? We sure hope it is. Uh, we're on page 53. We have this nice little graph that overlaps into various things. We have a little black thing that says individual members hopefully the top of your skew your primary customer when you're going through this selection process is your best fit for these three particular capabilities profit your capabilities and your perspective all right class this was an awesome module you may not think it was an awesome module but you will see how much of what we started with today that we learned about from the past we're going to use going forward. The next segment, we're going to spend a decent amount of that talking about the dark side of CRM, which you guys are all interested in that dark side stuff. Right? Thank you for your time. I thank you for your energy. Enjoy.